Okay, good morning, everybody. Today we're going to be in Romans chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. Let me pray for us in our time together, and then we'll dive right into the scriptures. Father, this morning, as we come to your word, would you just magnify yourself through it? Would you show us, Father, how we need to think about you, how we need to act in relation to you, Father, how we can better reflect you in the midst of a dying world that needs to hear your gospel? Father, we love you, and we ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Romans 1, 9 through 12. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. So last time, we looked at the first couple of verses here, and we looked at the emphasis that Paul has on the centrality of God in everything that he does. He is doing God's work. He is spreading God's message. He is moving according to God's will. And so he prays, asking that somehow, by God's will, he may now at last succeed in coming to you. He recognizes that God is in control. God is orchestrating and moving things as he pleases. And so he is appealing to that in his work. So now, as we kind of push forward into 11 and 12, I wanted to elaborate on a couple of ideas here. First, in verse 11, he says, For I long to see you. So when he says this, he is explaining this for is similar to because. Okay, So he says, For God is my witness that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers. So this for I long is describing Paul's prayers here and his asking specifically that he may come to them. So in his prayers, he is mentioning the Romans and he is asking in the midst of that, Father, by your will, would you make a way for me to come to the Romans? Why does Paul make this prayer? He's going to elaborate on that. But I want to point out here that we see a longing in Paul for the Romans. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. All of this is describing longing. Paul's longing is for the Romans and their spiritual growth in the gospel. And that longing for their spiritual growth is affecting his prayers. Our prayers will magnify themselves in fervency and in frequency in direct correlation to our longing that fuels those prayers. Let me explain that. The more we long for the things that we are praying for, the more often that we will pray and the more desperately that we will pray. We will not pray often and desperately for the salvation of others if we do not long for the salvation of others. One of the reasons that our prayers suffer is because our longing is suffering. We are not longing for the things that we ought to long for. So Paul's prayers here in desiring to come to them is because there's a longing. Specifically, what does he long for? He longs here to see them and then to impart to them. Okay, what does he want to impart? He says it's some spiritual gift. There are some that would look to this passage and use this passage as a possible defense for this idea that in the church we know that someone knows the Lord or is growing in the Lord if someone is able to come and lay hands and pray on them and they express this spiritual gift through the speaking in tongues or some other manifestation 
and that that manifestation is evidence that God is doing work in their life. And they look at this and they say, well, look at Paul. He has a longing to see them, specifically that he may come and impart to them a spiritual gift to strengthen them. They would point to this and say, look, see, Paul is wanting to travel around and lay hands on people in hopes that they would receive this spiritual gift of tongues or some other miraculous manifestation of the Spirit. And I don't think that's what he's talking about here. Why well, don't I think that's what he's talking about here? Number one, it doesn't say anything about tongues or that sort of thing. And it gives this word here some spiritual gift. Okay, So it's not a specific one that he's necessarily talking about. I think the important thing here is what is the nature of the spiritual gift? What kind of spiritual gift? Some spiritual gift to strengthen. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, he continues. Look right here in verse 12. That is that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Look at this idea here of being mutually encouraged both yours and mine, each other's faith. That's why I don't think that it's helpful to interpret this this way. There is a mutual edification in Paul's mind of what's going to happen here. So how do we continue to unpack this and think about this? Well, the first and most obvious verse that I have to bring up, as commonly as it's quoted, it's still so vital that we see this, it's just wise. Proverbs twenty-seven seventeen: iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. So the idea here is that iron is sharpened by iron. Both of these, as they work together, same substance performing the sharpening on itself. So the same idea here, we have man sharpening another man. It's the same relationship. So this is one idea of what Paul is talking about and this idea that we want to be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Another example of this is in Second Peter, opening sentence of his letter. Simon Peter, a servant of an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Peter is writing to those. And Peter, he is a servant and an apostle. But despite that title, he views those as having, as having a faith of equal standing with ours. Why? Because it is composed of the righteousness of Christ just like theirs is. This is the common glue and thread that holds and ties us all together in the faith. Whether you're an apostle or not, you have a faith of equal standing with every other believer. If you are in the faith, you have a faith of equal standing as every other believer who is in the faith. Now, there are levels of believers who are striving after the strengthening of their faith and growing in their faith. But as far as your standing before the Lord, it is equal across the board. One more passage, and this is going to help us a little bit more, kind of flesh this out a little bit. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. So he talks about Jesus giving some gifts a little bit before this. And then he continues in verse 11 and says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherd, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, 
We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So God, Jesus, he gives all of these roles. God gave all of this, all of these different people with these different spiritual gifts to carry out these things. Why did he give it? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry and for building up the body of Christ. The goal is unity of the faith, that we would all be mature, that we would have the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we would be able to stand firm. Skipping down here to verse 15. How does this happen? It says that we are to grow in every way into him who is the head. How do we grow? Look at this phrase here. By speaking the truth in love. So we grow as we come together and speak the truth in love. Who does that? These that he gave equips the saints to do that. So the saints are the fuel for all of this happening, this whole machine here. We grow up into Christ here, from whom, from Christ, the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. So Christ equips the body with these joints, and when each part, each joint of the body is working properly, the whole body here makes the body grow. So speaking the truth in love, the body builds itself up in love. This is iron sharpening iron. This is how we all grow up together into Christ to achieve this unity of the faith. So tying all this back to Romans here, this is what Paul's desire is. This is what he's talking about when he wants to see them to impart to them some spiritual gift. This isn't Paul coming and saying, okay, let me give you this magical spiritual gift now that's going to suddenly bring you up to my level in Christ. Here's what his idea is. Here's the spiritual gift that I have to offer. God has designed me in a specific way to help build up the body, just as he's designed you in a specific way to help build up the body. So my desire, I long to see you so that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine, and that in that, there would be a strengthening that happens. That is the spiritual gift. That is how God has designed the body to grow. We speak the truth in love to one another so that we may all grow up and achieve unity in the faith in Christ, being mature in our faith. So, here's a question for you. Is that a longing that you have? Do you have a longing to be able to sharpen other believers as they sharpen you in the faith? Or is this unbalanced? How would it be unbalanced? On the one hand, you may have some spiritual pride that you believe that you have all of this great depth of insight to offer without recognizing that there's much insight that you need yourself. It is so easy to get in this position without even intending to. We just naturally think about what others need instead of thinking about what we need. We hear a great sermon and our first thought is, man, so-and-so really needs to hear that. This would be good for so-and-so. But we do that more than we say, man, I really needed that. This has sharpened me in the faith. Another way that this happens is that we maybe tip the scales the other way and view church as that one time of the week that we come to be poured into. And we are here so that we can grow, not ever thinking about how God intends to use us to sharpen the faith of others. So may we long to be mutually encouraged by each other's faith 
in the body of Christ, in our local bodies of Christ, in our congregations. May that longing guide our prayers during this time so that somehow by God's will, we may at last succeed in coming together to impart some spiritual gift to strengthen one another. It may look different right now, but this is still God's will for the church. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word this morning. Father, we want to long for you and your gospel. We want to long to see your body built and strengthened in the faith, Father. And we long for you to use us for that. So, Father, we are asking that somehow by your will in the midst of COVID-19 and everything going on right now, that you would remove the obstacles that are preventing us from being able to do that. That you would help us to seek creative avenues to be able to sharpen the faith of one another. Father, use each of us to sharpen each of us through your spirit and the gifts that you have given us because of Christ. We thank you for our faith that is based on your righteousness, the righteousness of your son. And it's in his name we pray these things. Amen.